So work in the church isn't the only work that's being done in the area. Some of you have noticed that they're starting to do some work on the roads, too. And they're tarring and chipping the roads. And, of course, they chose the first week of school to do it all. So I'm sure the bus drivers are very pleased with all of the construction going on. And I got to tell you that I have been praying for a heavy rain to knock the dust out of all of those chips that they put down on the road because it is horrendous. Now, many of you know that we've got a creek that runs through our property. And I often use this creek as a, a gauge to how much rain we've had. Uh, by the way, our creek is pretty much bone dry right now. Rhonda says there's a little trickle running through, but all I see is rocks. Well, a little ways down the street, our neighbor, he's dug a pond to prevent flooding in his property. So now I watch its level to see how desperate we are for rain. Since I can't see the water in the creek, I'm watching his pond level. And what I've noticed is how, because it's low, this water has turned green, and it doesn't move. The algae is taking over his pond. Now, last year, when we had lots of rain, the water would flow into and out of this pond, and it looked like it could sustain life, maybe. Like he might be able to put some fish in there if he could keep the birds away, and they might survive. But this year, it looks dead. You see, living water rains, runs, flows, and swirls. It washes away impurity. It transports nutrients. It sustains leaf and stem, blood and bone. Where water flows, life abounds. Where water stagnates, disease takes hold. Where there is no water, life can't even begin. Now, today, like in ancient times, the climate of much of Israel was defined by a rainy season, which was winter, and a dry season, which is summer. And if you didn't live near a natural source of living water, such as a spring, Water could be hard to come by, and it was truly precious. Now, ancient Israel invented the cistern, which made it possible for Israelites to settle and thrive in highland regions that had previously been inhospitable. And these settlers, would, they hewed bell-shaped cisterns from bedrock in order to collect and store supplies and surplus water from the rainy winter for use during the arid summer months. Now the cistern's bell-shaped with a narrow opening and a wide well. It, prote it protected the water within from contamination and even evaporation. Now in places where the bedrock was formed predominantly from chalk, the chalk formed a natural seal when it was wet, further minimi minimizing water loss. Now elsewhere, Cisterns could be sealed with a plaster compound made from slaked lime to prevent water from seeping out into the bedrock and losing the water that they had stored up. These familiar features of daily life in Israel and Judea, they provided the context and the vehicle for Jeremiah's metaphor in our scripture for today. So I'm going to invite you to turn to our scripture. It's Jeremiah, it's chapter 2, and we'll be looking at verses 4 to 13. It can be found on page 523 of the Bibles that are in the pews. We're going to be reading responsively from this. I'll read the first verse. I'll clue you in to read the next, and we'll go through them. But it's Jeremiah chapter 2. We're looking at verses 4 to 13. And it's on page 523 in the Pew Bible, so you can follow along. Chapter 2 of the book of Jeremiah, starting with verse 4. And it says, 
Hear the word of the Lord, you descendants of Jacob, all you clans of Israel. Read verse 5 for me, please. Verse 6, they did not ask, where is the Lord who brought us up out of Egypt and led us through the barren wilderness, through a land of deserts and ravines, a land of drought and utter darkness, a land where no one travels and no one lives? Read verse 7. The priests did not ask, where is the Lord? Those who deal with the law did not know me. The leaders rebelled against me. The prophets prophesied but by Baal, following worthless idols. Read verse 9. Cross over to the coasts of Cyprus and look. Send to Kedar and observe closely. See if there has ever been anything like this. Verse 11. Be appalled at this, you heavens, and shudder with great horror, declares the Lord. And verse 13. God of communication, throughout these weeks of summer, we have learned from your prophets, those people who heard your message and shared it with the world around them. We have learned truly what a prophet is in your eyes. Give us each the opportunity to hear your message and share it with others. In your loving name we pray, amen. Now for us here today, where water flows from taps and travels in plastic bottles, it's difficult to grasp the force of this metaphor. Many of us live with little worry about having water at any time of the year and give little thought to the technologies and the processes that make that possible. But this very distance from the source makes us all the more susceptible to the changes God is leveling against the house of Israel. So what is this metaphor and passage about? It's about idolatry. It's a familiar subject, but Jeremiah uses a new metaphor to help his people see it with fresh eyes. The tricky thing about idolatry is that often when we're doing it, it doesn't seem like we're worshiping a false god. It seems like we're worshiping a true God, or it seems like we're pursuing good ends ordained by our true God. It seems like we're pursuing the something necessary for our survival, and if we believe that our true God desires our survival, then surely the thing we pursue is not idolatrous. See, even if there are cracks in the foundation allowing the living water to seep out, even if it feels empty and dry, even if it really is draining us of life and soul, we don't realize what we're doing. And unfortunately, part of the blame for us feeling like we're still pursuing God when we're on the wrong track is the church's fault. You see, we've been hearing for years, every week that we come to church, that God is right beside us, that God is still with us, that God will never leave us, that God is on our side until we're not. Does that make sense? I mean, God is on our side, but sometimes we wander away. Sometimes we're off track, and that's what sin means, being off track. All the shouting in our text today is because folks don't know that they're off track. This isn't anger or wrath. This is God calling God's people back 
on track. I mean, they've wandered off. Worse, they think all that all they've received is due to their own efforts rather than it being a gift from God. They've forgotten to be grateful. All their gratitude has leaked out. And that's the image that Jeremiah offers. We leak. We can't hold the grace of God, the water of life. Oh, we receive it. We fill up week by week, but it leaks out. And if we don't return to be filled again, we're going to go dry. We're going to be running on empty. And when our cisterns get empty, the cracks get bigger and we leak faster. And then we start looking to fill up in wrong places, which leads to idolatry. See, we need to return to the source, the one who gives that fresh living water. No one, Jeremiah reminds us in this text, thought to ask about the author of all the goodness that the people enjoyed. No one thought to wonder where God is in the business and the busyness of their lives. So, here we are. We're, we've gathered this week to worship and to do that very thing, to fill up on God's presence and to ask where God is in the rest of our lives. And to be reminded that, yes, God has always been present. We're the ones who wandered off. We're the ones who said that we could handle it on our own. So now we're back to ask again for God to be present, for God to make His self known to us. And we need to do it again and again because we leak. We are cracked cisterns, letting the presence of God leak away from us day by day until we return to be reminded. But you know, there are things we can do to be reminded throughout the week that God is still there, that we need to focus on Him and that we need God's living water. We could pray. We could pray the same prayer at the same time every day, in essence, praying together while not being together. And if this, is, if this is something that interests you, as you're leaving today, there's a little prayer on the back table. Grab one and just follow the instructions. That every day at noon, I'll be praying that prayer. And anybody who wants to join can pray that prayer. We will be praying together separately. We could also become involved in church activities like the choir or small groups. We could volunteer for church-related things like Sunday school or the youth group that Vicki and Josh are going to be heading, the Good News Club that's going to be starting up. We have a lot of things that we could get involved in to bring us together and help us remember and to be filled. We could fellowship and associate with each other on a regular basis like the men's prayer breakfast on Wednesday mornings, the Friday morning breakfast that we get together. And if neither of those fit your schedule, you can start one of your own that fits your schedule and have people join you. But we can come together and fellowship with each other to help fill our cisterns, to remind us that we need to return to the source of that water. Now, Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. See, that's what our fellowship does. It helps maintain the living water in our leaking cisterns. Now, friends, we, we are the prophets of this time, responsible to bring the news of Christ and His living water to our communities. These prophets with whom we've traveled this summer They've already concluded their ministry. Elisha, Amos, Hosea, Isaiah, and Jeremiah, they've spent time healing and pleading and loving and weeping for a lost people, a people whose personal deterioration led to communal suffering. And now it's our turn. 
We are the prophets of this age. And we need to be in our communities speaking and sharing God's message and His Word. God cannot be pleased at where we are as a society in these moments. God can't be pleased with ill treatment of those seeking refuge. God can't be pleased with the hatred of people because of their color. God can't be pleased with people not caring for the sick. God can't be pleased with increasing poverty and decreasing opportunities for people to change their destiny. God can't be pleased with a people who have displaced Him with other gods. Gods like bureaucracy, Christian nationalism, exclusivity, self-righteousness, greed, and religious abandonment of mission and service. He can't be pleased. And it's our job to be the prophets and to take His word to these people. Friends, there is still a plumb line hanging from the wall. There's still a summer fruit basket in the churches. There's still a vineyard with only wild, sour grapes. There's still a fig tree with good fruit threatened by bad fruit. These things haven't gone away. They're still there. And it's our job to talk to people about them. The question is, are you willing to act as God's prophet to bring this message to your segment of society? Are you willing to hear his call and say yes? Yes to spreading his love wherever you are, even to those who are unlovable? Will you say yes to reaching into the margins of our, of our community to spread God's living water to those thirsting for it? Are you willing to be the prophet that's needed in your section of this, of this community. Because what a tragedy it would be to glance at the margins and see no sign of a prophet there. What a tragedy when we have so many people sitting in churches on a Sunday morning to see no prophets where they're needed. Are you willing to be that prophet? Let's pray. God of the prophets, you call us to reflect your character and glory. Forgive us when we have failed to live up to that calling. Forgive us and empower us again to be the people of God who point to your righteousness and justice as the life-giving ways for all people. Give us the courage to name injustices, speak truth to power, and point to the truth of your love. Show us how to love the unlovable. Show us how to reach the unreachable. Help us do the impossible in your name. We ask this, Lord Jesus, amen.